We're now sitting in a silversmith's studio, um, surrounded by the tools of his trade. Um, and this, this particular silversmith is at Freeman College and he has an apprentice and he was an apprentice himself and that felt a very appropriate place to ask you to tell us about where your project started from. Well thank you for taking me here because obviously this is, um, like you said, a very interesting place for me. I'm interested in this relationship of being an apprentice, a relationship that you have to someone who might be a master or a teacher, um, somebody who has maybe um, more knowledge than myself, um, but um, it's not really necessarily clear from the beginning where that knowledge is or what that knowledge is or even how this knowledge can be communicated. So the knowledge weaves itself into this relationship between a master and an apprentice or a teacher and a student. And I, I suspect it weaves itself into this relationship like tools to a body or tools around a body where you, you see all these props here, all these um, models um, for, for turning. You have machineries and they all extend the body to some extent or function in, in relation to the body when knowledge is exchanged. It takes place um, through a transformation of material or matter. How did you, as an artist based in London, end up in Germany for three months become, being an apprentice mm. at this point in your life? Initially, I was interested in the profession of, of my teacher. He is a concrete beautician. So he's not, he doesn't just put concrete on the wall, he does something special with it? Yes. So the, a concrete beautician, even though the name implies the word concrete, hardly ever works with concrete itself. It can be defined as a post-production process where their surface is cosmetically beautified in a way. So it is like makeup for concrete, but the makeup is not, doesn't consist of concrete itself. It's to enact a fantasy, a surface fantasy really. In a way, the process is very similar to um, mural work or even frescoes. There's a tradition in churches to simulate marble when marble was a too expensive material. And one could imagine the work of a concrete partition to be very similar in that a, a very thin layer of a concrete simulation is applied to concrete itself in order to make it look the way that an architect wants it to look. It's a, a material fantasy that is acted out and of course it comes out of a demand for a material to enact something that is technically almost impossible to achieve. But everyone agrees and becomes complicit um, in producing this and when they hit the technical impossibility the concrete petition comes in and actually it, he starts to enact this fantasy. Working on these construction sites in, in Germany, I actually witnessed what takes place there, how this is transformed, how the surface is recreated and changed from quite literally a state of before and a state after, and how this affects the spaces that this exchange takes place in. What stops the exchange taking place? It's as much as the possibility of it as well as the impossibility of it. So his language, his vocabulary, his discourse um, conducive for exchange. This is already a kind of question for my, my platform residency. Is something like an exchange outside of language? Is it actually to some extent speechlessness or not being able to communicate that ex when exchange takes place? Or is it a different kind of communication? So for your project at Site Gallery, you're going to turn this apprenticeship relationship around a little bit and invite the concrete beautician back to work with you here in Sheffield. I wanted to reciprocate um, my relationship with the concrete beautician. He was very generous and allowed me to work with him for several months and we 
traveled from different construction site to different construction site, about 16 in total. We drove about 7,000 kilometers. We lived together in container camps on these construction sites where we worked. And we, of course, developed a very specific kind of intimate relationship, um, something that might be outside language or discourse. So it was a very kind of, very specific kind of architecture that we worked in. They were all public buildings. These were schools or auditoriums, libraries, swimming pools. At the end, um, Via del Brato, that's his name, he said, you know, you've seen the places I work in, but I don't actually know the places you work in. And this then led me to think of a project at Site Gallery and being able to reciprocate our working relationship. It's quite an amazing opportunity, really, to be able to invite Viorel to Sheffield now and to see what actually, how this relationship that we developed in, in Germany, how this can be extended now in a gallery space that became a workshop in Sheffield. Of course, this is an experiment. Um, but I guess this is what a residency should be, or this is what the platform residency can be. When people come to your, see you, what might they expect to find or see in the galleries during your platform residency? There were several thoughts um, on how to open up my engagement or my interaction with Viorel Brato, the, the, the concrete petition, to an audience that might come to site gallery while working on the construction sites there it's very clear that the the post-production taking place there the work that i was shown and, and started to learn was a semi if not entirely invisible work it is meant not to be noticed it's work that doesn't leave traces behind um, because of its very nature of being makeup it's supposed to look natural as if it was done by magic it's not meant to look laboured. Nobody should actually notice that we were there. We were supposed to be invisible workers. Now, the side gallery is not a place where invisibility takes place. It's quite the opposite. It's a very visible place. Everything about it is visibility. And so, of course, um, part of my residency will be to look at what happens if these activities that are actually supposed to be hidden were in invisible, when they are becoming visible and when they are slightly moved out of the wings, so to say, and put on center stage, when they are brought out into the spotlight. Along with this, I also um, want to have several conversations about different kinds of educational models with people who might know more about this than me, and also I would like to host during this month several models intended for um, a kind of knowledge exchange, teaching aids out of different contexts from maybe Montessori schools as well as teaching aids or teaching objects from more historic university collections. And throughout my life I've, I've had engagements with different kinds of education, so different forms of learning. I was um, a Steiner student. I also studied a year in, in an alternative high school in, in Alaska. Learning is a, is a very specific word to give these kinds of engagements already. I would, I would say that they are primarily forms of being together. In a way, they are forms of collectivity. Before calling them learning, I would call these collectives um, exchanges. So. Something is given and something is received and this kind of exchange flows and there is not necessarily um, an a priori direction to this flow. It's not clear who is giving and who is receiving or not always. And I think um, it becomes more concrete or it becomes more set but also flex inflexible when these kinds of exchanges become models and these models become standardized. 
Um, so I think at that point it would become learning and it can be called skills and it can be called training. Um, and then these sort of exchanges enter a very concrete language, a very specific language. Um, that it can be marked, it can be evaluated, it can be assessed. And, um, but this, this is when it becomes a very specific kind of model with its own very specific kind of vocabulary and discourse. But underneath of this, underneath all of this, is what I would call an exchange, an exchange that takes place in a collective. And I think two people are already a collective. The project or the residency is is probably layered in in a way that um, it allows me to look at different kinds of conducts or different kinds of exchanges that take place or can take place in in the gallery space. During the residency, you'll be making something. Um, it might be something that then looks like something was never made, but that's quite exciting for us as a, as a gallery, knowing that something will be produced, but it might be made invisible again at the end. One part, of course, of exchange, and this is why, coming back to the, the title of the, of the project, Matter of engagement is of course what this exchange produces or what comes out of this exchange. Is it something that facilitates the exchange? So something that exists already before the exchange take place, takes place? Is it something that registers this exchange so it comes out through the engagement? Or is it something that documents it so it succeeds this exchange and actually survives it and lives on afterwards. My, my thoughts for this residency are to slightly blur the boundaries between these three levels of exchanges or these three kinds of materialities of exchanges and actually mix them up slightly, maybe in a, in a bit of an unexpected, unexpected way where it never really is so clear what is the chronology of the exchange and what is registering what.